So I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about um, how the OU approaches learning design. Um, and then I've got quite a few activities to do over the course of the afternoon. Starting with a little bit of an apology because they're quite paper-based activities and I usually like to do things which are very technology-based and to make use of um, lots of technology and innovation. But actually what I've found in workshops is that it's good to just have some paper and write on things and get the conversation going. And that's really one of the main aims of this afternoon, is to, to really give you a lot to think about and to discuss. So I'm hoping that once I've set you off on things, you will find that, that the conversation runs away with you. So um, just a quick um, summary of why we do learning design at the OU. I'm sure that you know these figures already, but just a, a quick reminder. So... Um, at the OU, obviously, we, we have, well, we have t about 200,000 students, but we very rarely actually meet them. They're all at a distance, um, and although sometimes they will come to tutorials, the key thing is that when we're designing the courses that they're going to study, we're not there meeting them. So usually in a university and as a teacher, you can adapt what you're doing as you go along, depending on the feedback that you're getting and the response from the students and how something went. And, you know, that's kind of what I was always used to as a teacher, is that you modify things as you go along on an, in an, an iterative process. At the OU, we design courses that are going to be studied by thousands of students but we need to do it all at the beginning. And although there is scope for some adjustment as the courses go on, we really need to put a lot of time into thinking about what's going to work and what's going to be an engaging course. Um, so typically it takes us about 18 months to design a course at the OU. Um, and that will then run for something like 8 to 10 years. So it needs to be quite robust. There needs to be a little bit of flexibility in it. But one of the things that we do is that right at the start of that design process, all of the academics and the course um, teams have to go through a learning design workshop. And I've adapted some of the activities that we do in those workshops for you to use here this afternoon. Um, and one of the things that we found is it always our academics what they really want to do is get into the content. They want to start discussing their own particular area of interest, their own area of research, and they don't actually want to spend very much time thinking about the structure of that, because of course that's the, that's the bit that they're interested in, that's why they're here in the first place. But what we know is that if we force them to, to stop and take a, a step back and get a much better overview, then actually the activities that they design for students become much more engaging, much more varied. When we ask them to visualise their course profile in terms of activity types, they're much more likely to design engaging collaborative activities than if we just let them get on with their writing straight away because then they tend to just do a sort of much more traditional read this, answer these questions type thing. And actually the interesting thing is that a lot of our students feel very comfortable with that form of study. Just give me a book, let me sit down, read my book, answer my questions, thank you, I feel very comfortable with what that's asking me to do. So in terms of student satisfaction, that type of learning is really popular. However, our data shows that students are much more likely to be successful if you really challenge them, push them out of their comfort zone and force them to do something different. And for the key thing, the key activity that we know that students benefit from is some kind of communicative, collaborative activity. Now I realise that that's quite difficult within a MOOC and we touched on that this morning, that that practice of trying to have a forum activity or some kind of dialogue is tricky. It's, it's hard to moderate. It's hard to manage when you've got people all over the world, when you've got people accessing it at different times. But it is possible, and we know that by incorporating that kind of activity into your course, the students are likely to engage really well, and they're much more likely to complete it um, and to be successful with it. So that's kind of one of the things I really want you to be thinking about this afternoon, is that um, sort of profile of activity types and I'll come on to talk a bit more about that in a while. 
Um, so one of the things that we've really found with our learning design workshops is that this face-to-face -face collaboration and um, getting, as I mentioned earlier, getting opinions from lots of different sources. Usually we try to have career staff, library staff, um, people from the technology teams, people from production, all lots of different contributors to feed in at the very start of the process so that we can think about all the challenges and everything that's coming up and try and um, capture that, but think about how we're going to allow for those. Um, and I just wanted to quickly throw this in. Some of you may be familiar with Charles Jennings and his 70-20-10 concept of learning. So the idea, it's, it's fairly crude and there's a lot more detail to it but that I'm not going to go into. But basically the idea is that traditionally we've used this approach on the right where we think about 70% of our learning being via formal education. And in case you can't quite read it, the first column is experience and the middle column is exposure, and the third column is education. What we're trying to do is to push that over so that we're focusing much more on that learning process which is rooted in experience. And you'll know from your own experience that actually the best way to learn is by actually doing something. And this is particularly appropriate when you're thinking about MOOCs, is trying to base it in people's own work experience, their real life experiences, and try and access those things that they can draw on from their real life that will then make that learning meaningful. So, finally then, um, in terms of practical learning design, as I've mentioned, we, we um, use a lot of activities, learning tools and materials and paper-based things, and I'm going to start slightly oddly by asking you to think about tweets but with um, using some paper and pen. <laughs> so um, what we're going to think about is the question of what do you want your students to be saying about your course? Imagine that you're 18 <coughs> months down the line and you've had several hundred people going through your, your MOOC. What sort of thing do you want them to be saying about it? Um, think, so think about people who have completed it, who are telling their friends and colleagues about it. And so p part of the purpose of this is to sort of set the, the framework and the feel for what do we want our course to, to feel like. But it's also to think about marketing. How are we going to market it to new people? And I know there was quite a lot of talk about that this morning. Um, and then it's to think about how are we going to target it and focus it. Because in a MOOC, you can't be all things to all people. I know you're trying to target lots of people, but it's really important to have a, a focus and a clear goal of who do you want to be attracting to this. So we're going to use a tool that we call the Word Wheel. And this is available online. You can just search for Learning Design Word Wheel. Oh, and that one's just fallen apart, so I'll put that one down for a minute. Um, but actually, I'm going to give you a paper-based version of it. Now, what we've got here is words that our OU students provided in their feedback about courses that they had studied leading up to, I think it, it was completed in 2015, so a couple of years ago, but it won't have changed hugely. Um, perhaps if I just pass this out, it'll help me to explain. So there's several copies. Um, we don't have very many of these left. This is the original word wheel, so I'm just going to put one on each table. But what I've done is I've printed out for you there a set of the words. So on this word wheel, the words are grouped into four sections. And you'll see on the back of the sheet that Martin's giving out, the coloured wheel, which is actually at the back of this word wheel. And if you're looking on the, the front, it's the same set of words in this table on the front. So at the top, you've got, you've got your sort of your core words, innovative, demanding, professional, supportive. And what I want you to do in your teams is to pick one of those words as your core word. Which of these do we want our course to be like? What do we want our students to be saying about our MOOC? When you've picked your top level category, 
then pick your second word from the three sort of subwords underneath. So, for example, if you pick professional, you're then going to decide how you're going to define that a bit more precisely. Is it going to be about skills, independence, or practical? And then having picked your second word, you're then going to choose a third word so that you've got a, a set of three that you think will describe what your students are going to be saying about your course. So the next activity that we're going to do is looking um, more specifically at who your students are. And I know some of you have started to think about this already. Um, so the purpose of this, um, at the OU we have loads and loads of um, learner analytics, loads of data about our students and the question is how do we actually make good use of this to support their learning? So some of that data is about their online behaviour and their, how long they spend on the VLE or um, how, soon, how long after an assignment do they log back in again and things like that. But actually some of it is just the much more basic information about student profiles. What are their student characteristics? How old are they? What's their previous um, study experience? What are their ambitions? Um, what kind of job role are they in at the moment? But it's also about some of the sort of more practical needs and experiences. So are they working full time? Are they a parent? Are they a carer? Do they have a disability? All of those sort of things which really affect how somebody is going to be able to study. And that's one of the things that's quite specific to distance learning because you're not having people turning up at a set time to attend a lecture or a seminar. You're relying on people's motivation and you've got to be competing for their time with all of these other things that are going on in their lives. So we've realised that it's very important that we take account of that and that we plan that in and we're aware of that when we're thinking about the course that we're writing. So what I'm going to ask you to do now in your groups, and I know you've already started to think about this, on these sheets there's space to um, identify four different students. Each quarter of the sheet is the same. And for each student it asks you to identify a few practical things, name, age, occupation, nationality, and obviously that's going to be quite important for you with the, a European-focused MOOC. You, you're hoping to attract people for, with lots of different backgrounds and nationalities. So what I want you to do is try and come up with four quite different student profiles to identify who are you trying to attract, who are the people that you want to be focusing on. So then four key, four key questions. What's their motivation for studying? Why will they be doing this MOOC? Has somebody told them they've got to? Have they realised it's good? Are they doing it just because they're interested in it? Then think about what are their expectations for the course. So again, are they doing it towards a professional qualification? Are they doing it because they want a promotion? Are they doing it because they're currently unemployed and they need to show that they've got some skills to get back into the world of employment? Then think about what's their educational background and experiences. So have they already been to university? Or did they leave school at 16 and perhaps didn't have a very good education experience and they're revisiting it now as an adult? And then finally think about their study skills, strengths and weaknesses. So perhaps this is the first time they've used <coughs> a computer for learning. Perhaps they're much more used to a book and a, a piece of paper to write notes on. How are you going to adapt? How are you going to teach them how to learn online? So quite a, quite a lot of detail really, but what we found is that by doing this it really helps when you start writing because you, if you, especially if you give them a name, you can refer back and say, right, have we allowed for what Peter needs and have we allowed for what Janet, you know, what her limitations might have been and how are we going to overcome that? And you can just refer back to those individual students when you start writing students doing. So I've put out activity planners on the tables. Um, and I'm also bringing around, so there's a, there's a fact sheet which 
basically summarises more or less the same information as you've got on the postcard um, uh, booklet. And then there's also a, a format for a bar chart, which I'm going to explain. So these activity types, um, it's a, a taxonomy, a, a method of um, coding what students are doing that's been developed by um, academics within the OU. There are various different taxonomies that people use. You may have heard of Bloom's taxonomy, which is a way of describing what people are doing when they're learning. And um, so this is one that, that the Open University uses. And when we are starting out on module production, we ask our academics to think about each of these different activity types and to think about what, what sort of shape they want for their course. So if you have a look on the screen, you'll see a, a bar chart. And the idea is that each of those bars relates to one of these activity types. And so we're, we're allocating percentages to say, I want 31% of my material to be assimilative, by which we mean attending to information, reading, watching, listening to some audio, thinking about things. That's sort of quite traditional form of study. Um, and in this example, saying, well, I want 13% of my activities to relate to finding and handling information. That might be interpreting graphs, it might be going out and finding something from a website, it might be doing some calculations. Um, the important thing with this is not really to get too hung up on the, on the precision of the numbers, but to be thinking about a sort of an overall feel of roughly what do I want my students to be doing. And in terms of a MOOC, obviously there are some limitations to what you can ask students to be doing, partly because of the, the limit of the time that you've got, but also because of just the nature of, of what you're doing in the MOOC. So, for example, um, assessment is likely to be quite limited. Often, in our OU courses, we start by saying, well, we know that we've got a requirement that about 25% of the time is going to be spent on assessment. And it could be that you incorporate some quizzes, say you have a sort of a multiple choice thing where people can do response and they can get some, some immediate feedback, but you're not going to be having something where they're sending off an assignment because that's just not going to be practical within the, the shape of the MOOC. But you might still want to think about, well, how can I test their knowledge and test their development? And perhaps that's going to be a sort of self-assessment type format. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those activity types because it's on here, but I'm very happy to discuss it individually with you if, if that would be helpful. What I would like you to do in your groups again is to use the, um, the blank form, the, the bar chart form, and to just be thinking about what sort of shape do we want for our MOOC. So do we want there to be any communicative activities where they're discussing things on a forum or where they're, perhaps it's saying, go away and have a chat with a colleague about this. Um, do we want there to be um, any productive activities? So productive is really when they are, when they're producing something. They might be creating, building, they might be making notes, they might be um, <coughs> taking photos. So where, where they've got sort of something to show for it. So what I really want you to do, it, just for 10 minutes or so, is to be having a think about how are we going to direct our students to be doing these different types of activities. And the particular bit I'm going to point you to on these postcards is towards the bottom of each section is a list of verbs. So for example, on the assimilative one it says read, watch, listen, think about... And on the finding, handling information, it says list, analyse, collate, plot. And the reason why those are there is to help you to phrase and frame your instructions to the student so that you can be very clear about what you're asking them to do. And you can use these verbs as a way of sort of differentiating the different activity types. So just spend 10 minutes or so. Um, and I, what I'd like you to do in each group is to come up with an aspirational 
bar chart, a bit like this one on the screen, that shows roughly what you would like from your MOOC. And can I just say, this is something that people at the OU always find really difficult because they say, how can we do this if we don't know what the content is? It seems a little bit perverse to be doing it sort of almost the wrong way round. But what we found is that this process of visualising something aspirational can then structure how you go about the writing. And the next activity I'm taking you on to is very practical in terms of writing your MOOC. So I'm, and we're going to be using this planning that you've done. In this workshop, we've covered some of the key principles of learning design, which are establishing a student focus, adopting a collaborative approach, and using the learning design taxonomy to design a range of activities for student engagement. If you would like any more information on how learning design is used at the Open University, please feel free to contact us. Thank you.